When aspects of a complex case exceed your personal expertise, you bring in a co-counsel to add the specific insight your firm needs for next level results. Marketing in the legal industry requires complex strategy and insight far beyond anything you learned in law school. Want more for your law firm? Time to bring in a marketing co-counsel. Welcome to CounselCast. I'm your host, Karin Conroy, your marketing co-counsel. In every episode, I discuss marketing topics with experts who answer your questions and help your firm achieve more. Here's today's guest. Hi, everybody. My name is Wendy Lee Curtis, and I'm a professional corporate presenter, moderator, host, and MC for Fortune 500 companies. Hi, Karen Conroy. Hi, Wendy. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk to you. We always have the best conversations. It's super fun, super full of energy. And you uh, have such a good background in speaking, public speaking, being on stage, all of this stuff. And uh, it seems like this is such a topic I talk to clients about mm-hmm. all the time, like how they can get out there, how they can have these um, appearances and make them successful. So here's today's big question <laughs> that we're going to okay. cover. <laughs> drum roll. Okay. I should have a little drum roll. That would be uh, why do I need to be on camera? So let's start with that. Why, why is it important for lawyers to, number one, even just be on mm-hmm. camera, have their face on their website? Uh, why is that important? So I'm going to tie this into a question you're going to ask me at the end, but it, it, it all okay. works together. So I'm reading a book called Brag Better um, by Meredith Feynman. And she is a, um, a term that she has, that she's coined rather. It's called the qualified quiet. I want you to get that, that, the qualified quiet. I think that a lot of people that work in professional spaces think that their work should speak for itself, but that is just not the world that we live in. The louder you are, the more attention you get. And we know it because there are plenty of people out there that are just loud and wrong, right? It's very, it's it's seldom that we actually have the most qualified that are out there speaking to the masses about what it is that they really know, their zone of genius. And so that's why it's imperative for the people that really know what the hell they're talking about to be front facing in front of the camera. Um, It's your secret sauce. You're the secret sauce to what you do. And it's also a really key way to brand what you do and set yourself apart from other people. Um, I don't know if people know this, but like video marketing videos, when you upload them to Instagram, Facebook, they have conversion rates of 70 or 80 percent. Yes. That's huge. Yes. Anybody who's not in front of the camera is leaving money on the table. It's just as simple as yeah. that. Even when it comes to things like this podcast. Mm-hmm. So we uh, both obviously auto record the audio on this podcast. Mm-hmm. But from the beginning, when I set the strategy for this, I wanted to make sure that if we're going to do all this work, we're going to also record the video because why not? We're sitting here talking and we're going to look at each other anyway. Why don't I just push the button and we record that? And when I post little clips of this podcast where it might even have a photo of of us recording Mm -hmm. or whatever versus a little clip that has the video in there, the response rate is through the roof. People want to see us talking. They want to see our little quotes. They want to see what you're saying. And even if it's a four second little blurb, it does 10 times or sometimes more better than if I wrote out what your quote was. I mean, it's just, there's just this natural inclination towards seeing the the video, Mm -hmm. seeing the motion and being more connected. Absolutely. And it's brilliant that you decided to do the podcast because the only other medium that's (laughs) that's secondary to video is audio is audio. Audio has similar returns. Um, I didn't tell your audience this, but um, I'm a veteran of Broadway. Broadway. I was a Broadway performer for years, and I moved from Broadway into broadcasting. And so I worked for the ABC affiliate in Las Vegas, and I did their morning show. We were the number one morning show in that market. So I started off I doing it. traffic, which is unscripted, right? It really is just off the cuff. Yeah. You have somebody in your ear saying, you got 30 seconds, tell them what's going on. And I segued from that into entertainment reporting, and then from that into fill-in anchor positions on the weekends. And one of the things that I learned from that experience is most people, when they have the news on in the morning, they're not watching, they're listening. Yeah, They're running around, so putting true. on their makeup, they're making their coffee, they're getting their breakfast, they're preparing the kids, but they still want to know what's going on. And so yeah. it's 
I can't say it enough. It's vital that you put yourself out there so that people can get to know you. And I understand, I understand the desire to, um, to avoid it. Everyone thinks that because I did Broadway that like, Oh, you just must be such a natural on camera. You must love it. No, no, not at all. (laughs) It's a, it's a, it's a very different medium. It's, it's far more critical. I mean, you know, the closest seat on a Broadway stage is, I I don't know, 15, 20 feet away. Right. So you can hide a multitude of sins from that distance. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I think that's a really, first of all, it's really comforting to hear Mm -hmm. that someone who has been on camera, on stage, Mm -hmm. all of that still doesn't feel like it's like this super comfortable place to be. There's just something a little uncomfortable about being, you know, on stage or on camera. So that's, that's really kind of nice to hear. But um, why, why do you think it is that people feel so uncomfortable and how can they make themselves get over that hurdle and feel more comfortable? So there's two parts to that question. First, I would figure out the on-camera medium that feels the best to you, whether that's live, right? Off the cuff, yeah. unscripted, or whether it's pre-recorded video where you have a teleprompter, you have time to collect yourself, make sure you look the way that you want. So that would be the first thing is figuring out which of those mediums you're more drawn to and you feel most comfortable in. Most people that coach people for on camera, it drives me insane. So I'm I'm probably going to get a lot of pushback, like work to try to get people calm. You know, there's this, this, this overarching emphasis on being calm on camera. There's actually a Harvard study that shows us that that's antithetical to the outcome that you want. So anxiety, which is what a lot of people have when they're in front of the camera, is like a a high value negative emotion. Calm is a high value, low energy emotion. It is much, much, much easier to transmute anxiety into energy or excitement than it is to transmute anxiety into calm. And there's actually a terminology for it. It's called anxiety reappraisal. Anxiety reappraisal. So what I would say is, I always tell people this, especially if you're going live, like put on your favorite music, whatever makes you feel like that bitch, like what, (laughs) real talk, like whatever makes you feel like the boss, put it on before you go live. You can even let, I mean, there's copyright issues and you guys are lawyers. And so you probably know it's, it might be five seconds. It might be 10 seconds. You might even let some of the music like bleed into it, but it's like a surfer, right? That music is the wave out there in the middle of the ocean hop on your board and let it carry you into shore. Let that hype and energy, right? Get transmuted from the music into you. Camera comes on and you're there. You don't have to get there. You're already there. That makes so much sense to me because I would much rather watch this kind of a conversation where we both have a good amount of energy. We have a lot of things to say and it's got some energy there versus like listening to um, like a yoga teacher talk about like deep breathing exercises. (laughs) Like that's, that's got its place and it's time. But usually when you're really trying to convey something and educate people and inform them about certain things, you need to bring the energy into that so that it makes it more interesting and they feel like they're going to take that away. So that makes so much sense. There's a reason that every talk show has hype music before the talk show host comes out. Uh, it's yes. formulaic. I mean, this is, I'm not reinventing yeah. the wheel here. Like this is when, when I yeah. speak publicly in person, pre pandemic, when I would do large events, thousands of people, they would always ask me, what's your play on song, you know, or what do you want to play? Nice. Or they would select something because it, it's, it's, um, it's like Pavlov's dog. Like we, we have a physiological response to it. It's not even something we yeah. think about. It's just something that happens. And so right. as, as I told my daughter when she moved from Houston to Chicago, the harder something is, the more important it is to build ease into it. Oh, I love that. That's so, so good. So if you use that music, knowing that we have a, a physiological response to it that we neither control or can hamper, then that's something that you can set to the side and then focus on the more important thing, which is what you've come here to say. I love it. It also reminds me of just the idea of an audience. So even on sitcoms where they have the the fake laugh track or the fake clapping, 
And then as compared to during the pandemic, when some of these nightly shows lost their audience Mm -hmm. and the energy, even if the host was good and there and doing his thing, because there wasn't an audience, it just had such a different energy. Mm -hmm. They would tell a joke and it was just like crickets. And (laughs) even just watching it feels different even from the audience, but I'm sure for the host as well. So the whole thing... Um, it's, it's almost like bringing in that audience for you to just kind of bring the energy for, for you, as well as everybody who's there listening. You're, if you're recording it, you have to kind of artificially add that piece in. That makes a lot of sense. And it's a way to virtually wrap your arms around everyone who's come to listen to you. And, and I, I just want to remind everyone that your voice matters. What you have to say matters. Um, I don't care how many other times someone else has said it. They're still not saying it the way that you are. You're this, you're the secret sauce. You're the special sauce of this. So no one's going to do it, say it, show up the way that you do. So get out there and do it. That goes perfectly into my next question is why does this stuff matter for lawyers? Like why does leadership and speaking and kind of putting yourself out there, how does this even apply to lawyers and kind of how they can build their law firm? Like what, why should they even care about speaking and being in front of that? Audience? I would think it would be a core tenant, a linchpin tenant for um, attorneys. I mean, you, you, you're really tasked with walking into a courtroom and getting people on your side, getting people to trust yes. you, believe you and follow your directive. If you're not, you have to become a master communicator. And also you, you need to become masterful at, at making friends, at, yes. at, at, at being liked, but authentically, because people can smell the BS coming from a mile away, um, whether it's yeah. a jury trial or the judges in there. So, okay. So then what makes for that masterful speaker or MC or presenter, what are the things that they need to keep in mind aside from all of that awesome stuff about bringing in the energy and kind of being in that right headspace? Um, I would say, remember why you're there and, and why you chose this. There are a plethora of careers that we could have picked. Only you know, only you know your why for why you do this. Yeah. Remember why you're there and internalize that carry that with you into every space that you come in, um, own that and center that every time you speak, why am I here? What have I come to do? Why does this matter? Why is this important? So how did you learn to, I always hear, I'm not a stage person. I'm, I've never been a theater person in any way. How did you learn that idea of projecting your voice and kind of having that stage presence. Um, What are some tips that you kind of picked up during that part of your career um, that you convey now to people who are going and kind of getting on a stage or being in front of the camera? (laughs) So one of my cheat codes for it, um, you may or may not be able to do, but I try really hard to, to mingle with the people I'm speaking with before I speak. Oh, that's I good. try to um, meet some people, get their names. I do a lot of listening and I ask a lot of questions and try to get to know someone in that audience or, or multiple someones so that I know who I'm talking to. And a lot of times when I'm live on stage, I'll reference them. I'll see them somewhere in the house or I'll mention some, I mean, something that's not embarrassing or too personal. Um, yeah. I'll mention something or throw it in improvisationally while I'm speaking that someone shared with me while I was out in the audience. Um, especially if it's relevant to the topic I'm speaking about. Um, And then it also internally, it makes me feel like I have some people out there that are on my side. Yes. You know, I'm picturing like when you're in elementary school and all of a sudden the teacher starts kind of picking people out of the classroom and everybody starts like tuning in (laughs) because all of a sudden they're like, oh no, is she going to call my name? (laughs) Like it's also, it seems like a tool where all of a sudden, every, you know, everybody's like, oh, I, okay, maybe I need to pay attention because I think I talked to her for a minute and, and she could be talking to me in a yeah. minute. Like that, that's a, a clever kind of little trick, I think, to kind of pull people's attention back over to you. Yeah. And um, also a, a lot so, of people will avoid eye contact. There's always a friendly face in the audience. That's been my experience, yeah. whether I'm speaking or performing, um, I did the national tour of Mamma Mia and it's the only show I've ever done where we had groupies. They literally followed us around from city to city. And I was an understudy for two of the leads. I was an understudy for Tanya, the mom's two friends, Tanya and Rosie. Right. And I'll never forget um, the first time I went on for um, Tanya. I was nervous. I had been nervous and 
two decades. You know what I mean? Like really on stage. But that night I was nervous because all of the leads, they, they do this show together every night and they have their own like synergy. And I, I didn't want to disrupt the flow and I didn't want to let everybody down. And I'll never forget um, when I walked out on my entrance, I could see the groupies like in the first and second row. And immediately, like I could feel myself like centering and coming into my power and just because my rehearsals were real bad. (laughs) (laughs) You call them put in rehearsals. The music director came in right before I went on and um, is Martin Axe, a British guy. (laughs) And he goes, taps me on the shoulder and he goes, well, do your best. I'm like, (laughs) because my rehearsals were terrible. They really were not because great. you had all that nervous yes. energy about yeah. it. Yeah, I, my yeah. put they, so my putting rehearsals were wretched, and I was literally my yeah. hands were literally shaking like this. I was like, oh. "Girl, pull it together!" And no matter how much I hyped myself, I couldn't get there. But the second I walked out on the stage and I saw, you know, the Mamma Mia groupies, I was like, "Oh, I'm an, I'm good. I'm good." There we mm-hmm. go. Yeah. And just feeling that love from them and just kind of that energy like that is, I think we can all remember moments where we've had to do either public speaking or be up on a stage. And it is such a, there's just such a, this instinctual response that we all have where all of a sudden you just have this major fear, the the hand shaking Mm -hmm. thing you're describing, the nerves and all of that. It doesn't really make any sense to me. I don't know why we have this kind of natural inclination. It's just like all of a sudden the spotlight is on you. And when we've had those times, for most of us who have not been on Broadway, uh, it's just been kind of these, you know, certain moments in our lives and there's just a handful of them, but they are memorable and they stay with you and you can remember second by second of those things. And you can only imagine like the people sitting in that audience probably have no memory of what those things were, but I can remember, you know, what I was wearing, like, you know, exactly what was happening. So I think there's really something to be said for acknowledging that, that fear that we all Mm -hmm. have and kind of getting up there and trying to, you know, get through it. Um, especially to that, that like, really beautiful story of kind of standing on the stage and then just all of a sudden it's like you can almost hear this like of like you see the people you kind of step into it and then I would expect like your hands stop shaking you just kind of go through it like you all of a sudden you've got it It, it, it's transformative it's transformative and when you're doing um when you're doing a panel say you're either the moderator for the panel or you're a member of the panel um internally i always treat those as is like a, a like a dinner party like these are people yeah. i've invited into my home and um the good news is is all the heavy lifting is not on you just remember that like it really is yeah. a shared a shared experience up there and really your your job is to listen people get so focused on the talking that they forget that a big big part of being a great speaker is listening is to listen and then respond authentically. I I love the idea of the panels because they're for, for, for some reason that seems more comfortable Mm -hmm. too, where you are sharing the Mm -hmm. stage. A lot of times you're sitting, sitting and you've got a table or whatever the case might be, but, um, and it's a good way of, of sharing, not just the stage and the anxiety, but also sharing the information. So you have all these different people bringing different things to the table at, at the same time. So that can be a good way to get a variety of different approaches for whatever your topic might be. Um, and kind of step into the idea of being on stage without, you know, going full only solo on stage Mm -hmm. by yourself. Um, all right. So, the last question I have is what you've been reading, what book you have to recommend recommend to our audience, and uh, what what kind of ties this all together. So I actually, I belong to this org- to this membership group called Hello Seven, um, which is how we met. Um, Rachel Rogers, yes. yes, runs it, and there's actually um, a fellow uh, member in there. Her name is Meredith Feynman, and she finally introduced herself in our Facebook group. And her book is called Brag Better. And oh, I was I fascinated by the title. And she talked a bit about herself and about her journey and why she was there and what she hoped to accomplish. 
And so, um, like I was telling you earlier, I love to get audio books uh, because I love to hear the book in the author's voice. So I, yeah. I think I've only had it two days. I like to ride my bike and listen to this audio, yeah. audio book, um, Brag Better. But she really talks about, uh, t- there were two things that really jumped out at me. The person who coined the phrase in- imposter syndrome was interviewed multiple decades later and said that she wished that she had actually uh, coined it differently, that it wasn't a syndrome, that it was, um, what's the word I'm looking for? An experience. Oh. She said it's not an affliction. It's an experience that you're having when, you, when you're when you grappling with imposter syndrome. Um, she said if she had it to do all over again, she would have coined it differently. But she talks yeah. so powerfully about why informed, empathic voices matter. Lawyers are the firewall of the country that we live in. Is it Aristotle that said the law is reason free from, is it emotion? I can't remember what the, the, the opposite word is. I'm thinking legally blonde here, but I still remember Holland Taylor (laughs) saying that um, when she was teaching the class, it's, it's imperative that those who truly know who are working in their zone of genius, who really can speak to what matters, um, the preservation of the Republic. (laughs) I mean, because these are not theoretical things. This is real time stuff that we're living through right now. Our front and center speaking. We have so many people out there that are loud and wrong. They're, 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 they're intellectually wrong. They're factually wrong. They're morally wrong. They're spiritually, they're just wrong on every yeah. level. And it's imperative that the people that really are geniuses at this start to learn how to brag better, which is just, yes. it's just a factual accounting of what it is that you know, yeah. a factual accounting of what you've accomplished and, yeah. and getting it out there in the way that reaches the masses. And that's through this little thing right there. Exactly. And this is not the time to be quiet. Oh. I think, you know, the, the one thing we've learned, not just in, during COVID, but during everything we've gone through in the last couple of years with George Floyd and every all, all of these movements that have been happening uh, all at the same time, all of this immigrant crisis mm-hmm. and, you know, not to get political, but at the same time, it is not the time to be quiet. These are things that are at our core, you know, of our humanity mm-hmm. and who the, the country is, like you said, and uh, the people who have gone to school, you've had the privilege to go to school and grad school and figure these things out and understand the law at a different level and to speak to these things, like you said, on a factual basis Mm -hmm. and get your voice out there to represent these, these positions. And so, um, it's really in the best interest of our entire country for, you know, so this is, this is your job to get out there and get your, your message in a, in a way that is con- conveying that compelling idea and gets you through all of those hurdles of being in front of the camera and, and, uh, you know, being worried about public mm-hmm. speaking, you know, those, that's the smallest thing to be concerned about. And then also like Wendy. the discourse, the level of the discourse is, is raised yeah. and heightened when everyone who's, yes. who's working and speaking in their zone of genius is front and center. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Instead of talking at these very low mm-hmm. kind of, uh, ignorant sort of messages, we're bringing it up to, a you know, more intelligent conversation, um, Speaking of intelligent conversations, this has been <laughs> such a great <laughs> intelligent conversation. I think it's so helpful. And just recognizing that people have some fears and concerns around it and not to run away from that, to recognize your fears and then work through it so that you don't just lose out on the whole idea of being in front of a camera, mm-hmm. getting your headshots out there. I have some clients who don't even want to take headshots and have their photos on the website. It's like, okay, we got to get through mm-hmm. that. Like, th- let's figure out whatever that issue is yeah. <laughs> because we have to, you know, that's at the get, very get you know, your, basic Get your level. glam squad, you know what I mean? Get the photographer yeah. who understands lighting. You know what I'm saying? If you're a person of color, make sure the person who's shooting you like has a portfolio full of people of color because yeah. we have to be lit differently. Like, 
so that of your course. best self can show up. If you, if you take that off the table so that you don't have to focus on what you're wearing, what you look like and, and how you look like, then you can just be present, be present to what yeah. it is that you're there to do, whether it's take the prettiest picture ever or <laughs> speak to camera or being up on a stage yes. and really, you know, it's talking from your zone of genius. And, and I think it also does build your own self-confidence the more you do all that stuff. And when you get those great photos done, all of a sudden you look at them and you're like, oh, I look fantastic. <laughs> yes. And I should have done it a yes. long time ago. Yes. Or you get people in the audience that come back and say, oh my gosh, I learned so mm -hmm. much from what you had to say. And you realize that there's, there are people out there that need to hear what Desperately. you Desperately. It's not fair to, to keep hiding. There is someone who's, whose life is hanging in the balance. Yes. And that's not hyperbole. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's true. Right. Absolutely. Wendy, thank you so much for being here. This was super fun to see you and to have this conversation, but also super informative and such a great thank conversation. I really appreciate it. I love me some Karen Conroy. Thank you for listening to this episode on the Council Cast podcast. I know that by implementing what you heard today, your law firm will achieve more. Be sure to visit the website at council-cast.com for the resources mentioned on this episode. If you enjoyed the episode, I would appreciate it if you could rate and review the podcast on Apple and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. See you on the next one.